this morning, I really want to, to talk to you about a couple of things, and I need you to pay, pay attention. I need you to pay attention with your spirit, not with head knowledge, but with your spirit. Open up your heart this morning. Let us open up our spirit to what the Lord is saying to us. I really want to speak today about the fullness of God. The fullness of God. And the key passage today is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. But I'll be touching here and there. You know how I, I share the word. I kind of go here and dip in and dip there. And it's really good for you to take down these notes. I do pray that you will be able to take down some key passages today. That And even every week that you should be taking down these notes. I, I look back through my diaries where I've taken notes. And it really blesses me in the moment that, you know, I can look back and I've taken key things. So it's like, you know how, how you simmer a pot? Like if anyone's really good at cooking, like, you know, you simmer something and you get the real goodness out of it, right? And so, you know, that's what sometimes note writing is like. And then reading those notes back years later, you just read that, that, that really, that rhema stuff that just touched you in that moment, and it still speaks through. So I would really encourage you, you know, I hope you, you guys aren't too scholarly, that you can't pick up your notebooks, and then you can't write some notes. Because I tell you, it's going to bless you later on in life. Even what I used to do is, um, I used to write in my Bible itself, um, and then my Bible fell apart, so, so I got a new Bible, and, you know, after that, I've sort of um, left that alone for the, uh, the online version. Not fair, is it? Uh, I should really go back to reading the, the, real, the real sort of manifest word. But, you know, the digital word is good as well. And the key passage here is the fullness of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The fullness of God. You know what? Jesus is so relatable. He is so relatable. I love some of J. John's one-liners, and this morning I thought I'd, I'd share a few with you. He said, if you take Christ out of Christmas, all you get is M&S. Uh, did anybody get that, or is it too early in the morning for you? you know, or are you sort of still in your beds, like in Psalm 150, thinking of Lord? of the Lord in your bed. Well, you know, what is amazing is that um, J. John uh, has written so many really amazing things about how relatable God is. Jesus Christ came into the world to do something for us. And if you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you discover Jesus being presented to us in so many different ways so that people can understand at least one of the pictures, one of the images. He's the bread of life so that bakers can understand. He's the water of life so that the plumbers can understand. He's the light of the world so that electricians can understand. He's the cornerstone so that architects can understand. He's the sun of righteousness so that astronomers can understand. He's the hidden treasure so that bankers can understand. He is the life so that biologists can understand. He's the door so that carpenters can understand. He's the great physician so that doctors and nurses can understand. He is the good teacher so that educators can understand. He is the lily of the valley so that the florists can understand. He's the rock of ages so that the geologists can understand. He's the true vine so that horticulturists can understand. He's the righteous one so that judges can understand. He's the pearl of great price so that jewelers can understand. He is wisdom so that philosophers can understand. He is the word so that actors can understand. He is the good shepherd so that farmers can understand. He is the alpha and the omega so that scientists can understand. He is the truth so that politicians and lawyers can understand. Jesus is the one how awesome is that? I love that. I love that. I love that he's so relatable. I love that he uses daily things to be described. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 to 19, it says that he would grant you, according to his riches, 
according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. In the inner man. You know that we are made of spirit, soul, and body. And so we must be strengthened in spirit. We must be strengthened in soul. And we must be strengthened in the body, in the flesh. And do you know what it says here? It says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Friends, we may be broken vessels, but when the Holy Spirit empowers us, we are uh, the, 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 the new wine skin that carries without a tear. Hallelujah. It carries without a tear because so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. There is only twice that the Bible mentions the fullness of God or Christ. And so the key passage here is in Ephesians being one of those mentions. I love what Paul writes here to the church of Ephesus. It says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. So here's the, here's the deal. If you were a friend of the king, okay, and you were a friend of, um, say, a farmer, and say you were a friend of, um, say, uh, a, you know, a commoner or what they call sort of, you know, someone who has n not much then and you and you ask for something okay um now the the common guy will give you according to what he has the farmer will give according to what he has the king of kings and the lord of lords the alpha the omega the unlimited uncreated god will give you according to what he has. Hallelujah. That is what it says here, according to the riches of his glory. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Not by any old spirit, but by his spirit. His spirit, his spirit of love, his spirit of power, his spirit of strength, his spirit of holiness, his spirit of wisdom and revelation through his spirit that we might be mighty, that we might be strengthened in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love. If anybody right now wants to know, what is the foundation of me living a godly life? You have to be rooted and grounded in love. The first commandment is love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And second is love thy neighbor. Hallelujah. As you love yourself. This is, this is what Jesus said was the pinnacle, was the pivot, was the, the center of all godliness. And that is that all the um, commandments rest on this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Honor thy father and thy mother. That's what the word says. And that's the only one that says, promise with it, for you shall have long life. Friends, the ground, the foundation, in order for us not to be shaken, in order for us not to be like moved by every wind of doctrine, is that we're rooted and grounded in love. 
is that we're rooted and grounded in love. Love for God, love for each other. That, and then it says, being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. So I just wanted to quickly touch, you know how we're reading Acts as well as the epistles. And in Acts 7.55 it says, but he, and who is he? That was Stephen. But Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. When we are full, and what you know, the, the, there's another version of the, um, the translation of the Bible, and it said every part of Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. Every part of his being was filled with the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And I, I beg to ask you, can you please find out, does that mean that sometimes we act and we operate not on the fullness of the Holy Spirit, as did the council in the time of Acts back then. But Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. This strength gave him the utterance, Lord, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. This was the strength that gave the utterance that Jesus gave on the cross, Lord, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. This is the love that we enjoy in Christ, the Jesus that draws a line in the sand and says, he who has not sinned, cast the first stone on this woman that you call has been living in sin, has been living in adultery, has been living in fornication. You cast the first stone who is holy. None raised a stone that day. None. And he turned to her and he said, I see none throw a stone at you. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That is the Jesus that we believe, the Jesus that restores us, that calls out the greatness in us, that sees beyond our sin, beyond our, our in incapabilities, beyond our inabilities, beyond our weaknesses. This is the Jesus that we love. This is the Jesus that loves us. This is on what we need to be rooted and grounded, whatever comes our way. Every challenge at work, every challenge in the in the in the in the in life, like for example in finances or health or family, just know that you are rooted and grounded in the love that redeems, in the love that restores, in a love that provides, in a love that gives of itself. And so that's the connection here to Acts. But he being full of the Spirit. In Ephesians 3.16 it says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. And we see how important it was for Stephen to have that Holy Spirit in him filled how can you endure the stones that came his way? How can you endure, endure the, the names that he was called? How can you in, endure the, 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 the fear that may come and cripple you so that you shut your mouth and do not declare the gospel of Jesus Christ? We need the Holy Spirit and be filled with the Holy Spirit. D.L. Moody was a man who was an evangelist and, you know, uh, he, he, it came to pass that they needed someone for the Sunday school. They needed someone who would take the children's ministry, as we would call it these days, the kids' church. And they looked around and they, they thought, okay, you know, let's, let's ask D.L. Moody to do this. Let's ask him to take. And one man stood up and he said, Why? Does Deal Moody have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? What is he saying? That, you know, what he's saying is that, is it Deal Moody that, you know, that has all access to the Holy Spirit? Um, and someone else stood up and said, my dear man, it is the Holy Spirit that has monopoly of Deal Moody. How amazing is that? 
How amazing is that? To be fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit, that he completely takes us over. Beyond our control, beyond our needs of the flesh, beyond our weaknesses. Can this be? Can this be? Can we do that? Is that reality? Is that reality? Is that coming? Is that for us? Yes. Because in Ephesians it says, all the fullness of God. All the fullness of God is what his children have access to. All the full. All the fullness of the Holy Spirit is what we have access to. Stephen had it. Stephen lived it. Stephen died in glory because of it. But he being full of the Spirit, this was a great contrast to the behavior of the council. The fact that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit shows the source of his courage, wisdom, power in preaching. J.B. Phillips' translation has insight. Stephen filled through all his being with the Holy Spirit. I want to be like that. I want to be like that. I want to be like that, Lord. I I want to be filled through all my being with the Holy Spirit. And, you know... If anyone thinks, oh, that's such a somber thought, that means I need to be in holiness. That means, hang on a minute, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is joy. Shabba. The fruit of the, the Holy Spirit is patience. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. Who doesn't have joy and gladness when there's love? When I am loved, when I am fully accepted, when I am not condemned, when I stand a new creation, I can surely say to you, I am loved. Because I know the other, the other predicament of that. It should have been hell. So when we take Acts up to chapter 12, it's Acts of Peter. From Acts 13 to to Acts 28, it's the Acts of Paul. And as Reuben says, we are in Acts 29. Hallelujah, the movement of his church in the present day. And so, isn't that amazing that I want to show you this um, thing, and I don't know if uh, you can see it. Can you see it? Okay, so what you see there is a diagram. What you see there is a diagram. And it says, you know, that Jesus came. It says, Jesus came, Jesus died for the world, and Jesus went to heaven. That's the incarnation, the resurrection, and the ascension. Right? Jesus came. Jesus died for the world, Jesus went. That's the incarnation, that's the resurrection, that's the ascension. That is called the gospel of Christ. And then we have the acts of the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit came, which is Pentecost, and the church witnesses to the world. So in heaven, Jesus is exalted by the Father, and on earth, Jesus is glorified by the Spirit. Ephesians 3.16, it says, to be strengthened with the might through his spirit in the inner man. But let's carry on. See, the inner man, just as real, just as real as our physical body, we also understand the importance of strength in our physical body, but many are exceedingly weak in the inner man. And I know I am, just as much as you. And we need Holy Spirit for that. And so we must stand on this prayer. This is a prayer that Paul prayed to the 
over the church of Ephesus. He said that he would grant you, that the Lord would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your heart. If you ever wanted to pray for a friend, if you ever wanted to pray for a family member, if you ever wanted to pray for your child, this is an amazing prayer. Oh, Lord, would you grant them according to the riches of your glory, that they may be strengthened with might through your spirit in their inner man, that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. If you're a leader in a leadership pos position, this should be a prayer that you pray over your team, friends. This should be, if you are in a workplace situation and you have people that you come into interaction with or you're a member of a band or you're a member of a worship team or you're a member of a ministry team, this should be a prayer that we pray. Lord, grant them according to the riches of your glory, not the riches of the farmer's glory, not the riches of my neighbor's glory, not the riches of my glory, Lord of your glory. See, it, was, it would be a disgrace to a king or a nobleman to give no more than a tradesman or a, a, pre, a, a peasant. If a peasant outgave the king, that's a disgrace. That is a disgrace. How can we then expect the Lord to give us a way the peasant would give us, the way a tradesman would give us, when he is king. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Being rooted and grounded in love. May be able to comprehend with all the saints. What is the width. The length. Depth and height. So I want to go into that. A lot of the time. A lot of the time. Um, what is the, with all the saints, what is the width, the length, depth, and height to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge. A lot of the time when you think of love, it's like really fluffy, like candy floss. Oh, love. You know, it's like a feeling or a, it can't be measured, it can't be. But Paul, you know, he was different. He had to have a measurement. Although, you know, God's love can't be measured. It's unlimited. Paul had a different view. It's amazing. He's put that you would know the width, the length, and depth and height of the love of God. So, you know, he tried to, he tried to measure it. He was like, I need to measure out this love. I need to measure out how amazing this love is. Like, where does it reach to? How far does it reach? How high does it reach? The love of Jesus has width. That's the first, the width. Say width. You can see how wide a river is by noticing how much it covers over. God's river of love is so wide that it covers over my sin and it covers over every circumstance of my life so that all things work together for good. When I doubt his forgiveness or his providence, I am narrowing the mighty river of God. I want you to open your eyes this morning and see a vast river. Not the Thames, my dear friends. Not the Thames. Beyond that, wide. Wide as the river. I know that in the Bible, you know there's the um, river Jordan, there's the river Euphrates, there's the river Tigris. I don't know, river Nile, where Moses was found. Just think beyond the Amazonian River, whatever it is, just wide. It's hard for us to understand because we have very narrow rivers here in the UK. But should you go to the USA, should you go in other parts of the, the world, the river is wide in parts. Wide. And so is the Lord's River. The Lord's river is so wide.
Psalm 65, 9. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. Full of water. In John 3.16, for God so loved the world, and that is your width. Your width is that it, his love includes everyone in the world. How many people is that? How many people live in the world today? Because that's how wide his arms are stretched out for us. What is it? Eight billion? Hmm? Okay. Okay. So, this is what Charles Spurgeon wrote, he was a Baptist minister. minister. Some of them seem to be so taken up with the height and length that they deny the breath. And you would think from hearing them preach that Christ came into the world to save half a dozen people and that they were five of them out on their narrowness. There will be more in heaven than we expect to see there by a long way. And there will be some there with whom we had very little comfortable fellowship on earth, who had fellowship with Christ, who are therefore taken to dwell with him forever. The width of God's love is evident from John 3.16 as to who he came for. If you take the Bible, Genesis talks about the, the beginning Exodus talks about a people being moved. Numbers talks about all who were, you know, names and people involved. Very boring in parts <laughs> to read. Deuteronomy, the blessings of God. But then you get Joshua, you get Judges, you get Ruth, you get Samuel, you get Job, you get Ezra, you get... I would say majority of the Bible is about a people or about a person. He cares for the individual. He cares for the group. His width is for God so loved the world. Global, that's the width. So if you wanted to quantify like, Pete, like Paul did, what it is, the width, that means, my friends, you are are loved because there is no escaping that it's in it's it's infinite as far as the east is from the west he has removed my transgressions from me that's what it says in psalms as far as the east is from the west he has removed this my sins from me and did you know that there's no measurement from the east to the west there is north pole south pole so there's a, a finite line but from the east to the west, it's just continual. It's perpetual. 360 degrees of width and love. The love of Jesus has length. When considering the length of God's love, what can we imagine? What can we look at? Like, how, What does that mean? What do you mean? We sing these songs, right? Your love is so wide, your love is so high, your love is so deep, your love is so strong. And we sing all of that, don't we? But sometimes do we understand how long Jesus' love is? And considering the length of God's love, ask yourself, when did the love of God start towards me? How long will it continue? Jeremiah 31 may give you some answer to this. In verse 3 it says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Today, what's the date? What is the date today? It's the 19th of July. His love was not just for the 19th of July. His love is not just for the 20th of July. It's an everlasting love. That's how long it is. <laughs> everlasting. What does everlasting mean? It lasts forever and ever and ever and ever. It's like, um, what's that? It, yeah, what's that formula? Is it pi? Is it pi? Um, 
like ether, yeah, infinity. It goes on, doesn't it? It's um, what is the formula for pi? Pi is equal to something. Anyway, but you get the answer point three 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 three, don't you? No, is that is that one? No, pi is. I don't know. Is pi three point one four? I don't know. But there is a number, isn't it? And you divide it, and it's just three point three 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 three. It's just it's everlasting, everlasting. There's no end to it. There is no end to it. That's what everlasting means. It lasts forever. So that's how long Jesus' love is. The love of Jesus has depth. In Philippians 2, 7, 8, 7 to 8, it says, Tell us how deep the love of Jesus goes. But It says, But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient obedient to the point of death so first of all the depth goes from heaven <laughs> actually heaven has a heaven so heaven's heaven to heaven to to our atmosphere to earth and then being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross you can't go lower than the death of the cross that is how deep the love of Jesus is for us. And he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He went down to the depths and took the keys of Hades. That's how deep Jesus' love for us is. Because he didn't want to leave anything unturned he didn't want to leave anything uh, not sorted out he wanted to he wanted to sort everything out for our good romans eleven thirty three says oh the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of god how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out oh the depth of his riches oh the depth of his riches how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Height. The love of Jesus has height. Did you find out the population? 7.8 billion. I thought, I thought it was 8 billion. <laughs> Sean says that's just India. <laughs> oh my goodness. Listen. 7.8 billion, that's the width. The love of Jesus has height. And we can see this in Ephesians 2.6. He has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How amazing is that? How amazing is that, that the height, that the height is that he takes us up, he takes the pauper and seats him as a king. He has taken us up, the lowly, the broken vessel, and the, 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 the clay in the potter's hand, and mastered and fashioned out of us sons of the living God, family belonging to him. And, you know, as it says in Ephesians and Colossians, qualified for ministry. And he has placed us in the heavenly places, hidden in Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father. And that is the height of Jesus' love. We don't deserve it. We didn't make it. We didn't prove it. We didn't do it. But he took us and placed us. He lift, he's the lifter of our heads. He's the king of kings. Therefore, we are kings. He is the Lord of lords. Therefore, we are lords. He calls us a holy nation, a royal priesthood. How amazing is the height of Jesus' love? 
God's love is wide enough to include every person. God's love is long enough to last through all eternity. God's love is deep enough to reach the worst sinner. Whatever depths of sin we're in, he went deeper. God's love is high enough to take us to heaven. Now do you see when Paul sort of tried to measure this love? Does it fit in your vocabulary now? What is the height, the width, the depth? the length of God's love for you. To comprehend the width and length and depth of height, of, to know the love of Christ. One of these philosophers kindly says that religion is a matter of belief, not of knowledge. This is clean in opposition to all the teaching of scripture. Religion is a matter of belief, but it is also on knowledge of him. Very important. So we must fill ourselves up with the knowledge of Christ. Romans 8, 31 to 32. These are some scriptures that you can stand on about the love of Christ. What then shall we say to these things is if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? The father that did not even think twice about giving up his own son, will he not give us all things? Romans 8.35 Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, famine, nakedness, danger or sword or COVID-19? No. Romans 8, 38 to 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus loved you and gave himself for you. So it is no longer you who live. He is with you. He prays for you. He is making intercession for you. He is the mediator between God and man. And the life that we now live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God. Our foundation is rooted and grounded in Christ. And the love of Christ for his church, for his children, for his bride. Father, I desire these. That they may be one like we are one. That is Jesus' words. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. He was scorned. He was shamed. He was spat upon. He was crowned with thorns. He bled sweat drops of blood in the, in the garden because he knew that he had to be away from God, his father, for such a time whereby he can go into the depths beyond all sin, below all evil, and behold the key of death so that we may not be able to face eternal death ever again Romans 5 5 and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us God's love is very connected to the Holy Spirit That's how Stephen endured it. 
and instead lifted his eyes heavenward. And finally to land that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Paul asked God to fill the Christians in Ephesus unto all the fullness of God. The word unto is a better translation than the word with. Paul wanted Christians to experience life in Jesus Christ, the fullness of God, and to be filled to their capacity with Jesus, even as God is filled to his own capacity with his own character and attributes. If you take a small plant, put it in a small pot, it'll start to grow. Take it out, put it in a larger pot, it's going to grow more. You take it out, you put it in a larger pot, it'll grow more. You'll take it, what is our capacity? What is our capacity? The word says, his name is a strong tower, the righteous run into it, and they are saved. How big is your tower? How big is your tower? The name of the Lord and how you praise his name is the size of your tower. If you praise the Lord for a tower that is for enough for a small family, that's how much your capacity is. But if you praise the Lord such that you can encompass a 25-mile radius like Reynard Bonke commanded, he would fly into Africa and there would be a 25-mile radius of presence of God infiltrating the souls in that place. How big is your tower? The righteous run into it and they are saved. If you're here and you're thinking about ministry and you've got plans, you've got blueprint, whatever the ministry name is, whatever your, your mantle is, whatever your, um, your expression of Jesus is for your community, I want to tell you this, that the ground is loving on God to a point where the name of the Lord is adored, it's cherished, it's revered. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. How strong is your tower? How big is your tower? Is all dependent on your worship of his name. The fullness of God means there's a capacity to behold. There's a capacity to behold. So that's why the psalmist says, overflow, what's that verse? Um, in Psalm 23, my cup runneth over, overflow, overflow, that was, that's what we were made for. When the widow gave the jars, the, the, the provision stopped on the last jar that she provided. She said, I have no more jars. What is our capacity? Because he is about to fill it. Open your mouth and I will fill it. That is what the Lord says. I love what Clark has written here. It says, among all the great sayings in this prayer, this is the greatest. This was a prayer that Paul prayed over the church of Ephesus. This is the prayer that we should pray over our saints, over our brothers, over our sisters, over our churches, over our ministries, over our workplaces, over our schools and colleges. This is what is the greatest of the prayer, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It says here, among all the great sayings, this is the greatest. To be filled with God is a great thing. To be filled with the fullness of God is still greater, but to be filled with all the fullness of God is utterly bewildering the sense and confounds the understanding. That's what Clark writes. And this is where I want to land today. That we may be filled with the fullness of God. And we, can be, and we can see that the fullness of Christ is mentioned in Ephesians 4.13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Knowledge. Again, knowledge. It's not just belief, my friends. It's not just faith. 
But we must search out his secrets. We must search out his truth. It says the knowledge of the Son of God. We must know what is the height, the width, the depth, the length of his love. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Unity is our entry into fullness. Unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God is our entry in to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Colossians 2.2, 2, we talk, we talked about the unity of love, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches, attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. Colossians 2, 9, for in him, that's Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In body. When you are filled with the goodness of God, you are filled with the riches of his goodness. In Romans 2, 4, it says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Show me a man or a woman that is in repentance, that has a, 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 a lowly spirit before God, and I'm telling you, he dwells in the richness of God. He dwells in the fullness of God. Because when we are filled with the goodness of God, when the presence of God was in Obed-Edom's house and it was starting to change dramatically in physical attributes, the blessings were being made manifest. Do you know what? Repentance is what is the result of that. Amazing, isn't it? Usually... When we, when we hit our foot against something, we go, ow, ah. And the Pentecostal will be like, get thee behind me, Satan. And the Methodist will probably be on his knees and say, oh, Lord, forgive me for I have sinned. We all react in, d in different ways. But I'm telling you about when it's happy and when it's good and when things are flowing and when things are growing and when things are hopeful and when things are... are um, in going the right way, we should be in repentance. I'm telling you this because there is a time of blessing coming. There is a time of blessing coming and how are we going to deal with that? How are we going to be a steward of that? It leads us to repentance. It leads us to fear of the Lord, my friends. That's what we see in Acts. When God moved, people fell on their faces. In Ruth 2.12, it says, The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Sometimes we need to work, and we'll get a full reward. But we also need to trust in God alone, and not be filled with pride by uncertain riches 1 timothy 6 17 command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty what does haughty mean it means filled with pride we can be filled with pride or we can be filled with the fullness of god that leads to repentance command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches but in the living god who gives us richly all things to enjoy I love it. I love Mookie's heart. You know, he, he came and he goes, I can't believe it, Ruben. You know, um, I started and straight after I started, I was, you know, called to the, the studio. And that's his heart, you know, to, to creatively bless nations with what the Lord has given him. He's got an amazing voice and he's got such a heart to serve on the bass that he picked it up not knowing a single note and he just picked it up from scratch not being taught because he wanted to serve 
and he's still learning and he still wants to to hone in on that craft but how amazing like even when we recorded previously in our previous church he was one of the most grateful he was one of the he was in he was in sort of a semi happy shock that he was ever even used in such a way it leads to repentance do not be filled when things are going right let us not be filled with pride but let us be filled to the fullness of god and his riches of his goodness leads us to repentance proverbs 22:4 and here i land by humility and the fear of the lord are riches honor and life write this down somewhere in your house by humility and the fear of the lord are riches who wants riches come on i'm going to put ho i'm going to put my feet up with this you know not only my hands my feet as well okay and my mouth open it and i will fill it that's what the lord says by humility and the fear of the lord are riches who wants honor who wants honor who wants status who wants to be recognized who wants to be given a good name who wants honor with honor comes favor by the way oh my goodness i see the honor of god on that person i'm going to come and lay the lay gifts at their feet because i know what the lord means to that person and i know how the lord moves on account of that person who wants life in the covid-19 situation oh yeah defo apps 100% 100% by humility and fear of the lord are riches and honor and life and we know that he talks about eternal life as well we don't want eternal death this is just passing friends so we can invest in everything earthly or we can invest in the heavens and have our mind on heavenly things because then all these things will be added unto us anyway hallelujah let's get the focus here friends i'm going to pray this prayer over us as we come to an end find my page 1 there it is lord come on hands out heart open with all humility and fear of the lord lord would you grant these loved ones according to the riches of your glory that they may be strengthened with might through your spirit in their inner man that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith that you that they will be rooted and grounded in love and that they may be able to comprehend with all the other saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of you lord which passes knowledge that you that we may be filled with all the fullness of god not just filled with god not just filled with the fullness of god but filled with all the fullness of god and that we shall see the goodness of god that leads us into repentance before you laying down our crowns lord